Just checking that I have. Um, just checking that I have gone live. Yes, I have gone live. So my apologies. Um, and we um, we do these webinars every week, and we try to answer technical questions. We do have collaborations. We post jobs um, through this um, through the ZP Academy. And I also want to say that we also have our developer zone. We also have a series of workshops, um, and I will touch upon that um, just briefly now. So just on workshops, um, I'm going to put a link, any, any kind of link that you see today, I will also put it um, underneath the um, video. You know, So these videos kind of go out streaming live to YouTube, and underneath that YouTube video, there'll also be um, links. So we do have workshops. I think these workshops are becoming increasingly important or useful, actually, because during COVID-19, we didn't do a lot of workshops, obviously. Um, but, you know, we did go on to doing a lot of online um, news and information and teaching. We'll also now do a lot more workshops. So there are workshops available. Now, in terms of questions for this week, um, I had a little bit of a hesitant start this morning, um, but I think I've got myself into the flow now, which is balancing various bits of technologies. Um, but what, question number one was about um, iron selective electrodes for sweat sensors, particularly around potassium and chloride. Um, the questions were around interferences, and the questions are around particularly potassium and chloride, and the questions were around things like volumes um, and whether the signal was proportional to volume, so we'll touch upon that. Um, another interesting question that came in as well is also a user on the hypervalue electrodes, and the user was kind of um, rightly saying that they're asking about materials of construction and also talking about the size of electrodes. And so I will talk about um, that this morning. Question number three, how to make a low cost ISE. Somebody wants to use ISEs, ion selective electrodes in teaching. So we will touch upon that. Um, question number four um, was regarding uh, the detection of markers for cardiovascular disease. So I will touch upon that. Um, question number five was measuring the conductivity on a evaluation board from um, ADI uh, called the CN0359. I think the word might be in the, uh, the, the secret might be in the, in the name there because it's an evaluation board. And those evaluation boards, they're not really scientific instruments. I think you have to do the science and then you're looking to commercialize it. So you kind of get like an evaluation board. But trying to do the science on the evaluation board, I really think it's the wrong instrument for that. Um, measuring pH on the ESP32. So there's really, when you look at this, there's a lot of um, you know, ISE type questions in here, ion selective electrode type questions, because the pH electrode itself is a form of ion selective electrode. Measuring pH on the ESP32. So we'll touch upon that um, as well. And then also constructing a multi analyte diagnostic. Um, really, I should sort of subphrase this and say somebody's interested in making a credit card uh, microfluidic, and I'll also touch upon that. So if we go forward a bit quicker. So question number one was um, really quite detailed. Um, and the first one was talking about interferences. So I'll talk about interferences on the chloride sensor. I'll talk about the ones that they listed and the ones that I would be um, also considering. I also think it's worth considering when you when people talk about interferences, you do have to understand or you have to consider it in the application matrix. So for example, um, if you're measuring nitrate in the soil, um, you could ask a question, is chloride interfering? Well, the question I could ask back is, if you've got chloride in the soil, that's salt, that's a really severe situation and actually you're not, you're not actually growing stuff in that field. So questions around about interference are actually linked to what's the application from the application, what's the sample? So you could always have interferences in life, but whether they're actually present in the real application is another question. And the reason I bring that up is because this application is um, sweat and some of the questions are around about nitrate and phosphate and maybe even sulfate here, which I didn't actually spot. And I'm not sure that those molecules or anions are actually in the sweat. I'm not, you know, I'd have, you know, you could do some book work and find out, but it's worth when worrying about interferences, you do have to ask yourself, are these interferences actually in the application that I am considering? Because I know I've said it already, there are always interferences in life, but whether they're relevant or not is another matter. And I think some of these interferences are actually irrelevant. Um, somebody wants to know about reproducibility. So when they say reproducibility, I think what they mean is um, an ion selective electrode has a sort of baseline and a sensitivity. And 
it's often the baselines that are variable, but the sensitivities are quite conserved. So I will um, touch upon that this morning. Just want to make sure that we're still streaming, okay? Yeah. And also they want to um, use potassium and chloride and they're going to use them in the same um, sample and I'll discuss that. There's a question here, it depends on the sample volume. It really shouldn't depend on the sample volume and I will touch upon that just very briefly. They're also asking about different configurations. You can bring sample to a sensor. Um, you can have a sensor in a beaker. You can have sensors that you just pipette onto. You can have sensors that have capillary fill. You can have sensors that um, have microfluidics on them. So there's lots of ways of bringing samples to sensors and I will touch upon that. Um, and there's also, they're also touching here about using a chloride resilient uh, potassium sensor. So a lot of biosensors um, use silver silver chloride um, as a reference electrode. And most of the time in things like blood, for example, the chloride concentration is actually quite conserved. That means, you know, there's typically maybe 135 millimolar, maybe 150 millimolar of chloride always in that blood. So that means the silver silver chloride reference is, is fairly fixed. Once you get into samples like sweat, um, maybe the chloride concentration is actually um, up and down. Maybe if you're dealing with urine, the chloride concentration could be up and down. So chloride resilient sensors, we started all reference electrodes. We started bringing those into play because we realized that they were um, being used in applications where the chloride is not necessarily fixed. I think samples where the chloride is fairly well fixed. Tear film, I suspect it's quite well fixed in tear film. Interstitial fluid, which is really important to wearables, it's pretty fixed. Blood, it's pretty fixed. Plasma, it's pretty fixed. Serum, it's pretty fixed. But sweat and urine would be ones that would be actually concerning me. And then they're asking here about reproducibility between um, electrodes. And really, reproducibility between electrodes is iron selective electrodes have a good um, conservation um, of only have a good conservation um, of sensitivity. It's the offset that shifts around an awful lot, but I will touch upon that um, now. First of all, there's a, the question was coming up about, you know, where the signal's proportional to volume. Um, if you come to one of our workshops, this is, this is part, this is a slide I took from the workshop, but the signal, which is the voltage you often measure, um, is obviously proportional to the concentration. When you look at this equation, which is the Nernst equation, I'm not gonna, I'm not trying to be, fancy or flash it's you know there is no volume um um in here so when you look at things like absorption uh, spectroscopy there's a length scale in there so it tells you that the kind of amount of sample that the light travels through is part of the signal with um with these iron selective electrodes there's no length in there there's no volume in there and um, there is a concentration because you want signal proportion to concentration but the volume is not in there and that sort of that's one of the benefits of electrochemistry that, you know, a typical glucose strip may have a volume of 300 nanoliters. Um, and so, you, you know, that it, they, um, iron selective electrodes and electrochemical sensors, they can actually work on quite small volumes. And yes, volume is not part of the signal. Um, now, I've listed out some of the interferences here. So is a chloride sensor... Um, confused by nitrate? Is it confused by lactate? Is it confused by phosphate? Bicarbonate? Whoops, a daisy. And there was also sulfate there, and I'm sorry I missed the sulfate. The quick answer is we have not tested that sensor um, against nitrate, um, lactate, phosphate, bicarbonate, or sulfate. Now, the lactate, I've never actually been asked the question. I sort of find it unusual that it would be interfered with by lactate because. That's a sort of organic um, anion, um, whereas this is a very much inorganic anion. So I doubt it, but we haven't tested it is the quick answer. The other anions here, um, well, the two of them here are nitrate and phosphate. I'm really, and then also you had sulfate listed out there. These are um, obviously anions, you know, um, like chloride. Um, they're significantly different types of anions, but I haven't tested them. But really, the reason I haven't tested them is because I, I wouldn't actually even think that they were necessarily part of sweat, not on any kind of scale that chloride is on. So it is important to consider um, when thinking about interferences and doing interference testing, whether um, these 
interferences that you're thinking of are actually relevant. The bicarbonate I could see as being um, relevant. I'm pretty sure bicarbonate is um, part of the buffering system, at least in blood. So I, I could see why it would make its way out. I just want to say good morning to Hitcham. Nice to see you, Hitcham. I can see why bicarbonate is um, is consideration. But the quick answer is we haven't tested against these interferences um, because most of them I actually don't think, for example, in sweat that they're actually relevant. Um, but we make those sensors available on our web store and if people want to kind of characterize them for their own application, then they're um, very welcome to do so. Interferences that I would think would be Again, I don't think there's actually much iodide in sweat, but the anions that I would consider, you know, as potential interferences would be the other um, what called halogens. So we've got iodide, bromide. I put chloride here, but chloride is what we're trying to sense. Um, but these would be more likely to cause interference. I could have put fluoride in here as well. So maybe I should have put the word fluoride in there. These are just the other halogens. But I would ask the question again, are they really in sweat? So... Um, the quick answer is at Zimmer Pigot, we do put these um, sensors and electrodes on our website. Um, for individual applications then, um, either we do it as a contract or the person buying the sensors then has to characterize them for their particular application. So I can't absolutely say that um, the sensor is not sensitive to nitrate, but in the context of, there's not many applications, I think, where chloride and nitrate are kind of, you know, many. There are many, I'm sure there are many, but... When I think about um, things like agriculture and aquaculture, I can see in aquaculture that being a problem, but in sweat, I'm not convinced that nitrate and chloride appear to each other. So it wouldn't be a, I'd, make, I'd do a more of a literature search on that rather than doing some actual experimentations. Um, this is just something that I sort of wanted to um, touch upon a, a little bit as well, is that um, when you're doing sweat analysis, um, especially with iron selective electrodes, this is probably worth coming to one of our workshops about, to be honest with you, because what I realized that um, the chloride reference electrode is chloride sensitive. Um, now, most of the time, chloride in biological solutions is, for example, at about 150 millimolar. Um, but if it was to change significantly, which I sort of doubt it, you're not going to go to one molar, but you can see that the reference electrode shifts and... Um, that's why sweat is in particular a, quite a tricky analyte. You can get quite nice, sorry, quite, quite a tricky application and quite a tricky um, anion to deal with. Um, oh, sorry, sample type to deal with. So be careful with sweat because the reference electrodes, um, if they're not modified in some way, are chloride dependent and it could end up confusing your signal. Um, and this is often the relevant range physiologically. So you can see that in that range, you know, the chloride's reference electrode can be um, quite a sensitive, um, um, let's say, thing. Um, now, that um, can also work um, in some ways in your um, favor. Because, for example, um, I was working with a company once that was um, essentially trying to make ammonium chloride sensor. And because the ammonium working electrode was shifting in proportional to ammonium and the chloride um, reference electrode was shifting relative to chloride they ended up with a stronger signal than they would have otherwise had because both electrodes one of the electrodes was responding to example ammonium one of the electrodes was for example responding to chloride and so they had um twice the signal that they would have otherwise had and so in that case it was actually quite advantageous to them but sometimes that's not advantageous to you, in which case you need to have a reference electrode that has a f um, is more, um, we can't say impervious because um, it's very hard to do, but less sensitive to chloride. Um, because at which point now the, the, the reference electrode should be fixed. And so you're only measuring the change in the working electrode and not changing an effect due to chloride on the reference electrode. So, um, hi Mo, I'm sorry, so, hi Mohammed, nice to see you. Congratulations again. Hope it's going well. Um, so I just want to say that um, you've got to be careful with sweat, particularly with the reference electrodes, because reference electrodes, if they're silver, silver chloride, are often chloride um, sensitive. Um, and you can actually use that in your advantage. For example, this ammonium chloride sensor, it was an advantage. Um, sometimes it just confuses you because you get a change in signal 
but it wasn't due to the working electrode, it was due to the reference electrodes. And I do have an old case study on this um, and any kind of links that pop up, they will also uh, be underneath the video um, as well. Modes of bringing sweat to sensors. So at Zimmer Peacock, we do have a sweat patch. Um, these are really for just doing sort of minimal proof of principle um, type efforts. I mean, the reason I say that is because most of the time, I mean, if you're trying to make a wearable sensor, um, I was, I often, you know, cite, for example, BioLink in San Diego, who have raised something like a hundred million US dollars just recently to do, no, they're not doing sweat, they're doing glucose, but it's a tough challenge to make these kind of sensors. So we have a sweat patch, um, you know, that adheres to the skin and can bring sweat to the sensor. Um, we have these capillary type devices. So this is not for wearables, but it um, gives you a sort of four microliter volume over the sensor. And that's perfectly fine for um, an, I an ISC, an ion selective electrode. We do have these filters. I don't really think that these filters, even things like, the reason these filters exist is for things filtering things like blood. Um, blood is, um, you know, is quite a dirty matrix actually. Um, whereas sweat is relatively clean compared to blood. So these kind of filters are, are for really um, filtering out proteins and filtering out red blood cells. And so, you know, giving you a serum sample. When you've filtered blood, you're often sort of left with a serum. Um, and so your serum is sort of more transparent, slightly cleaner than blood itself. So for sweat analysis, the sweat patch is a good idea. The capillary um, is fine, but I wouldn't recommend... Um, the filters it's not it's not the, what it's intended um for i just want to talk here about the idea of using potassium and chloride um together so i'm imagining that you've got a beaker for example of with 50 millimolar uh, potassium chloride in there you've got a sensor um in there that's potassium and you've got a sensor in there that's um chloride and so what i'm imagining is that we have signal i could really have written um voltage here but um, we have signal and what happens is um, on the potassium sensor, we have a certain signal and on the chloride sensor, we have a certain signal. Um, and then we actually double the concentration. We add in a, um, an aliquot of concentrated solution. We stir it up quickly and the signals um, change. If we're not protecting the reference electron on the potassium sensor and it is chloride sensitive, then we're going to end up getting a change on the potassium sensor. That's twice what I would have otherwise expected. So we're going from 50 millimolar to 100 millimolar. Actually, that's a really, yeah, potassium is not a good example here because potassium is not in those kind of ranges. But it says here that if that reference electrode is not chloride um, sensitivity protected, then you'll get more signal than you were otherwise expected. But you have to really think about this application and you probably have to un really understand the science as well because we can correct the signal by doing this. So we could say that the signal from potassium is actually a mixture of potassium and chloride. But because I have a chloride signal in there, I can go potassium minus chloride equals my corrected um, potassium signal. So sometimes you can um, fix problems by using material science or you can fix problems using maths. I'm not saying either of them uh, these is easy, but I'm saying you know these are the kind of tricks that um, what you know we essentially pull off or do um, at Zimmer and Peacock. Um, repeatability. Um, when we talk about repeat, so one of the questioners was asking about repeatability. Here's our potassium sensor and here's our pH sensor. One thing you'll notice is that they're extremely repeatable when it comes to the step sizes. So these step sizes, these are three different sensors. These are something like four different um, sensors. Um, obviously different analytes, similar manufacturing, but it does tell you something that it's the sensitivity that is actually quite conserved. It's actually the offsets that are the variable. And making a wearable ion selective electrode, this is something that we do. And you have to be, it's not something I can actually tell you how we do it, but coming away from the a bit need to do a one point calibration, the easy fix for this in this situation is to do a one point calibration. Um, measure it once with a known solution, you'll therefore be able to calculate um, what the offset is, you'll assume that the sensitivity is conserved and essentially you're on your way. Um, but in wearable situations or in IVD situations, you can't always do a one point calibration. And that is something that we do work on, but we, we work on it in unfortunately client projects because it's 
not straightforward. Now we do make these electrodes available on our website, but I do want you to know that you will find that the sensitivity is really well conserved. It's the offset that's the problem. And that's why when you walk up to every pH sensor in the lab, there's either two bottles of calibration solution or three bottles of calibration solution. Often, you know, you just do a two point calibration. But the reason they're doing that is because they know that um, the offset is shifting around all the time. You know, even the same sensor day to day, the offset will be shifting around on it. And that's something that we're quite aware of at Zimmer Peacock. And it's something that we have to often fix when we're work when we're doing um, product development with um, actual clients. Um, as a side note, it's probably um, there is a link here. It's probably worth looking at the ZP um, accelerator platform for wearables and CGMs, but that's very much a side note. So that's quite a I've so far talked on this subject for something like 16 minutes. It's not an easy subject to talk about iron selective electrodes in sweat. I think sometimes you just have to start trying. You can only you'd only have to try and learn from the mistakes and the, and the um and the walls that you hit. Question number two, I do have to go into question number two. Question number two was, somebody who has one of our hypervalue electrodes, they look like this, I think they're really quite good. And they've noticed that actually, they're doing a fairy cyanide cyclic voltammetry on it. And they've noticed that if they sh um, swap, this is, we often use this as the reference and we often use this as the counter. And they've noticed by swapping these, it makes no def difference to the voltammogram. And so their conclusion is, are they both silver silver chlorides? It is in the data sheet and they are both silver silver chloride. So yes, you've shown that you keep the working electrode the same, but it doesn't matter which one you use as the um, counter and which one you use as the reference. When you shift those two around, signal stays the same. And it answers a couple of questions. It does answer your question, yes, they're both silver silver chloride. And I'll answer why they are silver silver chloride in a minute. But it also tells you that this idea that the um, counter electrode has to be something like three times or sometimes 10 times larger than the working electrode. That's not always true. What needs to happen is the counter electrode needs to be able to do um, an electrochemical process at the same rate that's, that the electrochemical process is happening on the working electrode. So in order for that to happen, what you can do is you can make the counter electrode really big and therefore it's easy for electrochemical processes to happen on that electrode and the total um, um, kinetics on the counter, because the counter is bigger, they can easily keep up with the kinetics on the working electrode. So people like big counter electrodes because then it means that the working electrode is dominating the signal and the counter is so large that it's not, in, it's not restricting or inhibiting the total signal on the working electrode. But you've just noticed that actually by swapping our electrodes, you can go from an electrode that's that is bigger than the um, uh, than the working electrode to one that's smaller, but the signal didn't change. And I'll answer why that is the case in a minute. So traditionally, people tr we tell people use the working electrode in the middle. That's the reference. That's the counter. You've noticed that shifting these around it actually makes no difference. And people have traditionally said in the literature, um, you need a large counter which I've indicated black here and a small working but you can actually see that we can actually have a fair you know relatively a larger working than counter and it still works and when you look at some of the other vendors on the market they also have a larger working than counter uh, um, and so you know the question is what why is this well the, I, I explained it earlier on but the reason people tell you it has to be bigger is because um, you've got let's say you're doing voltammetry and prometry you've got current flowing through the circuit and ions flowing through the solution and you want that counter electro to in no way be the rate limiting step in this entire circuit so you can make it rather large and therefore it's not the rate limiting step but as already discussed actually ours can sometimes be um, smaller and yet our sensors work perfectly fine and the reason that is the case is because they're actually constructed from silver silver chloride and our silver silver chloride means that we have a large capacity to either accept electrons or give up electrons. The ability for silver chloride to become um, silver ions and chloride ions is quite, um, and silver atoms is quite um, easy. You know, that that's, a, I, I would sort of use the scientific word facile, but it's quite a facile reaction. And so when you make a counter electrode from um, silver silver chloride, you have the ability to sink a lot of electrodes or give a lot of electrons. And that's actually, 
um, thermodynamically it can happen quite um, relatively easily. Now, when you make an electrode from platinum, basically you don't know what's happening at your counter electrode. And so if you don't know what's happening, you better limit your risk by actually making it quite large because you might not have anything that's easily happening, but if you have lots of surface area, then the thing that's not easily happening, at least it gets spread out over the entire electrode. But when you put something on that counter electrode that you know it happens and it happens quite easily, then actually you didn't need to have such a large um, counter electrode. Um, I will, lots of our assumptions about the relative size of counter electrodes actually come from um, doing more traditional sort of cell um, electrochemistry like this, where you've got this kind of, you know, beaker in which the electrodes are sitting. So some of the th assumptions that are taught or in textbooks are because people are actually thinking about cells like this. In electric, in electrochemical biosensing, actually, you can have a sensor like this with a volume here, which can be 50 microliters or less. And that means this, and I should emphasize the word here. In this traditional setup, you have a large cell volume and um, a large cell volume to electrode area ratio. So you have a lot of volume and quite a small electrode area. In this scenario, you have a small volume of solution and quite a large um, electrode area. So they're inverse. In the traditional electrochemical setup, small electrodes, big volume. In the, relatively, in the sort of screen printed electrodes, configuration I'm showing here, it's actually a small volume and relatively large electrodes to that volume. So some of the stuff that you're otherwise taught is actually based on the idea of traditional electrochemical cells, not actually um, the kind of biosensing um, systems that we're actually um, talking about. The other thing to notice as well is on these screen printed electrodes, the distance between the um, working electrode and counter electrode could only be a couple of millimeters um, whereas in traditional cells, there can actually be some sometimes tens of millimeters gap between the working electrode and counter electrode. And there's a, and this shorter distance between the working and counter can, could give us problems in the biosensor world unless Zimmer and Peacock had mitigated that risk by what we have actually done. So what I'll show here is I didn't label these. I should have said this is current and this is time. So I'm doing an amperometric um, experiment here. If I do an amperometric experiment, like 50 microliters, and I put it onto that um, electrode, I will get what's called a Cottrell response, the current falls with time. Now, after some seconds, I might start getting a new signal. But in Zimmer Peacock, we don't get this new signal, but I'll talk about this. And what happens is you sometimes see this um, when you have a small volume and large electrodes and the counter and working are quite close, you can get the classic ex you know, response. And then you get this strange response here. And I will now discuss that. And this is why we in part make our electrodes silver, silver chloride. So what's happening is this, that you've got your working electrodes. It's an electrical connection with your um, counter electrodes. Current is flowing. And the counter electrode, let's say it was made from platinum. You don't know what it's doing, but it could be producing protons. It could be producing hydroxides. It could be producing hydrogen peroxide. Um, but these things, because the... In a certain, like a screen printed electrode, these electrodes are quite close to one another. You can actually have diffusion between them. And so that diffusion leads to this phenomena where um, everything's behaving correctly, but then the counter electrode material is actually diffusing and contacting the working electrode. And it's actually changing conditions. Or for example, in the case of hydrogen peroxide, it's actually electrochemically active and starts to cause essentially what a feed, what's called a feedback loop, a chemical feedback loop. So what happens is, Material produced here diffuses to here, is, is then increasing the current here, which then increases the current, which then imp increases their amount of production of these. And you end up with a feedback loop where the current just goes up and up and up. And I have seen this in experiments. Um, now at Zimmer and Peacock, um, we don't necessarily have that phenomena because actually we know what our counter electrode is doing. It's shuttling either silver chloride um, to silver plus chloride or it's shuttling silver plus chloride back to silver chloride. Um, so we don't get that phenomenon, but because in fact, silver chloride is insoluble, silver is insoluble, chloride isn't insoluble. But most of the time when you're dealing with um, aqueous samples, there's often chloride in there and biological samples as well. So it doesn't actually, mag it doesn't change the chloride concentration much. 
And so we don't get this phenomena because actually we make the counter electrochlorides and actually we have a phenomena that's um, much more typical. And so the questioner says, well, is your counter electrode silver chloride? Yes. Um, and you've discovered that, which, you know, and it's also in the data sheets. Um, it's smaller, yes, because actually silver chloride is quite facile. And the reason we do it is because in my career, I've seen this phenomena. And so when people are building biosensors um, upon our screen-printed electrodes, they're automatically protected from this phenomena. Um, it doesn't always appear, but it does appear. And when it does appear, nobody knows why it's there. And it's really due to chemical um, crosstalk between the counter electron and the working electron. It co creates this kind of feedback loop where current just keeps on going um, up and up and up. Question number three, it's 8.31, so I have to be quick. The questioner would like to make a low cost um, calcium, potassium, chloride, and sodium sensor. They'd like to do it like on the hypervalue electrode. So we do have these sensors. I understand in a teaching lab, they can be quite expensive. Um, and so what I suggest is we do actually have these solutions. You know, we have these solutions, potassium, um, sodium, these are activation solutions. Um, I hope I put a link underneath the video to these, but we do have these. These are activating solutions. They come, they you know, they come in one mil um, volumes, one milliliter volumes. I, I know that seems quite expensive, one milliliter, you know, for that kind of pricing. But let's just talk about how much material you actually need. Um, and I will talk about that. Um, there's a couple of videos here. Um, I'll just mute them. But the reason I want to show these videos is to say that we do show you how to modify electrodes on our website and we also show you once you've modified the electrodes how to actually let's say do some testing so um, these videos um, are definitely linked to underneath the video so this will bring you to the activation solutions and this will bring you to the testing video and the reason i bring this up is because you want to make a low cost um, iron selective electrode on our high provider carbon electrodes and i say thank you very much for th wanting to do that in the video, Solron says that she's actually pipetting 800 nanoliters onto the working electrode. So it's quite a straightforward procedure. You know, you can just take the um, electrode and she ends up modifying the middle electrode and she's got a little video about that. She does it and then she tests it. So you can essentially do the same. Um, what was I going to say? Yeah, she says in the video she uses 800 nanoliters if that's the case, then you should really be able to make a thousand sensors, you know, at least from the um, from the one mils of solution. So that should keep you busy in the teaching lab for some quite some time. You just have to be very careful that nobody knocks over the vial. So I do understand that um, concern. And also, you don't want to leave the vial um, open. You don't want things evaporating out into the lab. So, but um, it will make a lot of sensors. Um, so what I suggest is the hypervalue electrodes are obviously on our website. The solutions are on our website um, and you can do the pipetting. It's quite nice for a teaching lab to actually get them to essentially do the modification um, and then do the testing. So it's a sort of two part lab um, procedure. And we were doing this work recently in some of our workshops. And actually, you know, I think within about 15 minutes, we were ready to actually test the electrodes. So um, it can be a fairly quick procedure. Um, and obviously the hypervalue electrodes, I've got a link to it there as well. Um, question number four is really about cardiovascular markers. So um, we have a nice collaborator. Uh, they're interested in cardiovascular markers. We do have a troponin eye sensor. Um, we put a quite a lot of work into the troponin eye. The reason I bring up the image here is because if you're doing cardiovascular markers, they're often proteins or you know large molecules that are the indicators of... Uh, um it, it are often indicators of the card of, of cardiovascular disease i just want to say thanks to um, mohammed because he says the video quality is great <laughs> i've got I've, my internet is so much better these days don't worry I've, i went ahead and fixed it so troponin i um is something that we have i also want to bring up like d dimer is also a um, marker for uh, cardiovascular disease um i do want to say this is lumor uh, lumor lumora dx um they're a company with a long history, at least the founders are. are um, I want to say the, the founders are a guy called Ron Zvonzinger. He's been doing this for decades. And the only reason I bring it up is because um, this is not my product. This is definitely their product. But I do want to say that 
these guys often use electrochemistry, so it tells me that electrochemistry can do D-dimer because if Lumero, Lumero DX are doing it, then it, it, it can be done. So what am I saying on cardiovascular markers? Cardiovascular markers are very doable. Troponin I is something that we do have. Um, if I was doing troponin I or Lumero DX, then I would be using um, immunosensors. And most of the time, if somebody has a, um, a target protein, we can generally do it as what we call a proof of principle. Um, they're quite quick projects for us. Um, I've still got two questions after this question. So we've got three questions left. So, so um, delighted that somebody's using one of our spiral electrodes in its, as a conductivity sensor. Um, quick link here. What they're using it, they're actually using it is um, with a developer's board. So we had a quick look at this developer's board and it's a two electrode system. And I should have really said that um, the two electrodes that we would typically use um, are, and I'm just, uh, these ones here, this one here, and this one here, um, because they're the two gold electrodes. Um, I could I could go on all day about actually, you could get away with using the, using the silver as well, but it's, for now, I would just say, use the two gold electrodes on this. So there'll be the two pads. Um, in fact, this, this pad here and this pad here, this pad here and this pad here need to be electrically connected to um, the configuration pin one, two to one electrode and pin three, four to the other electrode. And then you have all these parameters, voltage, frequency, coefficient, and cell constant. In conversation with this particular person, they're trying to get um, approximately 12 and a half um, millisiemens and they're getting approximately seven and a half millisiemens. So it tells me that they're actually working, it's working not too bad actually. Um, by the way, these electrodes can work really fine, really fantastically. And they're correctly doing is they're, they're playing with their settings in order to essentially, because what this board is expecting is it's expecting a very traditional conductivity probe. Um, but these guys are using um, something that's very functional but in some ways it's non-traditional. And so you do have to change these settings until you've tuned it or calibrated it so that you get 12 milli um, Siemens as well. I do feel like um, that is a developer's board. It's not really, um, or in fact, it's an evaluation board to be fair to it. You know, it, it helps you evaluate the chip. They really need to be using an R&D instrument because you need to kind of have a much deeper insight into the into the um, signal before you then start thinking about the electronics. So I would have actually done it on a um, impedance spectrometer. Um, I would have actually ended up, because an impedance spectrometer C would allow you to play in both with the imaginary impedance and the real impedance. I suspect that that evaluation board is just looking at the um, real impedance. I'm sure that's fine, um, but we would have taken a sort of a broader spectrum look at it before we then went onto the evaluation board. But that's, you know, it's fine. I just want to kind of give that perspective. It's also worth saying that I know you're working with a spiral. Um, we've worked with our spirals. We've worked with our more rectangular electrodes. We've even compared ourselves against a much more um, traditional um, Toledo conductivity probe. And we really got the same answers all the time. Um, so what this tells you is if you're trying to measure things like in the milli Siemens um, per centimeter, then you can use many of our electrodes. And in fact, they end up giving the same answer as a traditional um, electrode. The reason that you would start using these screen printed electrodes for measuring conductivity is they're absolutely going to be super low cost relative to constructing something like a Toledo Pro. And also it comes back to that point earlier on that you know, we can test samples. Um, we could make a conductivity measurement on 300 nanoliters and less, whereas, you know, these traditional probes, you, you, you can't do that. Um, coming close to the end here, ESP32. So we delighted that somebody's using one. It looks like one of our hypervalue pH electrodes. I really appreciate them using it. They were asking a question about using an ESP32 to actually measure the pH um, probe. I actually didn't answer this one. I just took it straight to one of our engineers who uses ESP32. So we haven't done this where we've measured the um, pH um, electrode on an ESP32. We have not done it, but the he's got one of our cables. So, you know, we took a look at the cable. We took a look at the sensor. We do understand that. And um, the answer back, I literally just copied and pasted it. That probably would work. Um, and then he's rationalized it because you have a 12-bit A to C converter. Um, 
and therefore he thinks that you've got sufficient resolution to be able to measure the pH. We have not tested it. This is not something that we support. We're just doing this as part of community support to say we think it could work, but you have to do it. It's not something that we do, um, but it sounds feasible. He was worried that if your ne if your values are in the negative voltage range, then you can't, you know, you have to put an extra bit of circuit in there to deal with that. But I got a suspicion your vo your voltages will not be in the negative voltage range, and so his concern is not my concern. <coughs> I mean, I had a look at our signal, and as we change pH, I can see that most of our signals seem to be staying above zero um, millivolts. So I would just give it a go. We can't promise you it's going to work and we can't promise you what the noise is going to be like. But your answer to your question is, um, it seems like you're doing the, it seems like it's okay. And you literally have to give it a go. Um, just a side co comment for anyone that um, we do have these connectors as well. So if you're working with our, any of our sensors or any of our um, hyper value electrodes, etc. We do have these um, quite nice adapters with these. Um, allow you to cl click in banana plugs in the backside there. So just be a note of that. It's just if you can't make good electrical connection, you know, nothing's going to work. It's all going to be terrible. Um, and it's also worth saying that if you're really struggling with electronics, we do have a OEM solution um, as well that you can embed into your electronics. So you can be working at the system level. And if you're trying to then measure things like sodium and chloride and pH and conductivity, and we do do single purpose boards um, that will do, essentially do that for you. And it's sort of removing just one of the headaches um, from the effort. Last question here is um, somebody wants to make a, um, a multi-analyte microfluidics device. We have a credit card format um, just for your interest. I've got the video um, going on here. So the idea of this, this is a credit card. You could put a single sample up here and the sample will distribute um, down to several wells. Um, and um, you, can, uh, you, you can sort of play with the idea now that you can do things like sodium and potassium and chloride and pH and conductivity um, all on the same credit card. You have to make electrical contact with this credit card, but um, that's what we're playing with. And we do have a construction kit for doing that, uh, which is also on the website and linked to here. Right, ISE, iron selective electrodes for sweat sensors. Sweat is a complicated matrix. I'm really sorry about the fact that sweat has a variable chloride concentration and that's what really confuses. Iron selective electrodes have a good conservation on sensitivity, but it's the offset that's the problem. And single point calibration would, would really help with that, but it doesn't really work when you're trying to make a wearable um, sweat sensor. Um, Hypervalue electrodes, you're right. We make the counter and reference out of silver silver chloride. And it means that actually the counter doesn't have to be three times the size of the working electrode because silver chloride um, is very good, or silver silver chloride is very good at either giving up electrons or absorbing electrons, um, which you've already noticed that the size is actually not um, important. And it also, the fact that we make these electrodes out of silver silver chloride stops this crosstalk between the counter electrode and working electrode. And people don't talk about crosstalk. Uh, thanks, Hitchum. I know you've got to go and I've been talking too long. Um, we don't get cross talk because we actually make them out of silver silver chloride. Um, lower cost ISEs, you can actually just buy a hyper value electrodes, buy our solutions and make your own um, ISEs. Detecting cardiovascular um, biomarkers, most of those would be amino assays. You know, we have troponin eyes, no problems. And also, um, luminal DX has shown that D dimer is definitely possible. Measuring conductivity on the CNZ359, I suspect that these people are already solve this problem um and i would agree with you just change the parameters until you get if you've got a calibration solution change the parameters until you're matching that calibration solution we would have actually done it a much more sort of deeper dive on the research side of it and then gone to the evaluation board but you know it's your, definitely your choice measuring the ph on that esp32 looks like it's possible i would be worried about noise it's not something we've done so just sort of on your own but good luck with it and um, then constructed multi-analyte diagnostic then we do have that credit card format so i have done 45 minutes this morning i want to say thank you very much i'm sorry i had to speak quite so fast but 
take care have a good day people um everyone and um we do our blog and um, we so we do our vlog on sundays at 8 a.m that's just a wrap up for the news and then if you've got any questions send them back in and we'll be here again next week all right well take care thank you very much cheers to hitchem um thank you to aftab and have a good day guys take